Hey everyone, Tanner here, and I'm back at it again. In this one, I'm going to show you how I do some maintenance on the Firebelly Toad Paludarium and keep it looking its best. To recap, I started this tank back in June of 2018, but I didn't have it up and running until around September. From there, I let it run for roughly a month before adding the toads. A few months later, I added a school of about 20 white clouds and a rogue zebra danio. Here we are about 4 months later, and in my opinion, this setup is still doing extremely well. In fact, it's getting better and better with time, just as a setup like this should. Now during that 4 month period of time, I consistently received questions on how I maintain this setup. Based on your comments, I think you'll be surprised by how simple this setup is to take care of. So I'll give you a brief rundown on what it takes to maintain this paludarium. You probably know that this setup is on a custom built rack. The way that I designed the door on this shelf was so that it could be used as a shelf when doing maintenance. As you can see, when it's opened up, it doubles as a sort of tray where I can put all of my tools. Pretty cool, right? Anyways, I've got my trusty Aquascape scissors and a container to collect plant trimmings. Yes, you guessed correctly, we're going to start by trimming the plants. Before I start trimming the plants though, I like to look for anything noticeable that can easily be removed by hand. There's usually not much like this because I typically remove things over time as I observe the tank. From there I went and did a proper trim. I know that some of you, including myself, will slack on this, but trust me, a good trim will serve you and your plants well. Worst case, your tank doesn't look as full for a short period of time. Trimming plants will stimulate new growth, promote the health of the plants, and you could use your trimmings to create denser patches of growth, or you can use them in other setups. Take this Pilea and Volucrata for example. I trimmed a few of the unruly sections and replanted the cuttings in areas that I felt were lacking. As I said before, this process is extremely important. On the surface, it might not make sense to trim plants that look like they're doing really well, but allow me to elaborate. When you trim a plant, you force it to respond to this change with new growth. Rather than putting its energy into the existing growth, it wants to survive and instead puts its energy into making new growth. Not only that, but the new growth often comes in thicker than before. This of course also helps promote the health of the plants. As plants grow and compete, they often choke one another out. This is obviously the natural order of things, but if you want to maintain the look of your scape and promote the health of each plant and not just the ones who dominate, then trimming is imperative. This will allow you to keep all of the plants nice and healthy regardless of how they grow. Some you will trim often, while others will rarely, if ever, need trimmed. As such, I only do this part of the maintenance as needed and not on a specified time frame. Sometimes I trim every few weeks or sometimes every few months, it all just depends. What I'm getting at is that regardless of the type of setup, make sure that you keep up with trimming your plants. Trust me, you and your plants will thank me later. Now that the plants are all trimmed, we'll move on to the water feature. Most of the time I'll do a 20-30% to 30 water change every other week. As you would expect though, I do a deeper clean every other month, which consists of a larger water change, gravel vacuuming the substrate, and replenishing the botanicals. Since I'm using a lot of botanicals in this setup, the gravel vac is not as straightforward as it would be in other setups. With that in mind, I have to remove all of the botanicals and sort through them, otherwise they would clog the siphon. Keep the botanicals in mind because we will revisit them in just a moment. With all of the botanicals removed, you'll notice that there's a lot of waste and debris that was hiding under this layer. 
That's not a problem for this type of setup, and that's exactly what happens in nature, but it's never a bad idea to remove excess debris when working in a closed system like this. Now then, let's remove some of the debris using the gravel vac. During this process, I did about a 50% water change and removed as much debris as I could. I'm removing what I can, but if there are some leftovers, it's not that big of a deal. Now we can fill the tank back up with some dechlorinated water that's been brought up to the right temperature using a pump. As usual, I'm using a little dish to diffuse the water so that it doesn't stir up the substrate. In case you were wondering, this tank holds about 10 gallons of water. So when I do changes, I measure everything with 5 gallon buckets. Keep it simple, right? 5 gallons out and 5 gallons in. With the tank filled up, I used a small net to round up any remaining debris. Again, I can't expect to remove everything, but I might as well try to get what I can. From there, the filter could be turned back on, making this tank fully functional once more. As far as filter maintenance go, nothing needs done at this point. On that, a lot of you commented on the original video, saying that I wouldn't be able to remove the filter for maintenance. However, I did explicitly state in that video that I designed the setup so that the filter could be easily removed. All that I have to do is remove the top piece of slate, pull the filter forward, and it pops right out. I'll try to record that process next time I clean out the filter, but I wanted to mention it in case you were wondering. Before doing the gravel vac, I also removed some of the slate stones from the water feature. Prior to moving forward, I had to go and put all of these stones back in their respective locations. Now we'll add the botanicals back into the setup. Before doing so, I shook them around in a bucket of dechlorinated water to remove excess debris and to select pieces that were in good shape. Again, this is not at all necessary, but given the amount of organics present, I don't think it's a bad idea. Don't worry, all of the biofilms and other goodies will appear once more in no time. Anyways, all of the existing botanicals were carefully placed back into the setup. Lastly, I sprayed down the tank and let everything sit for a few days. And here we are just a short time later. Everything is looking good, but we need to add more botanicals since I removed some earlier. I had to boil these and soak them for a few days, otherwise I would have added them the other day. What I'm using here are primarily oak leaves and a few twigs which came in with the leaves. These components were of course added to both the land and water areas of the setup. The ones on the land will help perpetuate the bioactive aspect of this setup, while the ones in the water will benefit the fish and elevate the overall design. Here we are all maintained and ready to go for the next few months. Naturally, I'm really enjoying this setup and it's definitely one of my favorites in the room. I really like the way it looks, it's easy to maintain, and all of the animals really seem to enjoy it. The fish are always very active and really fun to observe. The fire-bellied toads on the other hand always have me surprised. They're very bold and inquisitive, but you never see them right away. It's not because they're hiding, but because they blend in so well. Plus, as you saw in the video, once they know you're doing something in the tank, they instantly want to be a part of it. I've had them for 6 years now, so chances are that they learned that hands mean food is soon to follow. Unfortunately for them, that's not always the case. Another aspect that I like about this setup is that it's never the same paludarium twice. What I mean is that the botanicals are constantly changing, so no matter what the enclosure is always different. So if you're the type of person who gets bored of a setup quickly, maybe you'd benefit from trying out some botanicals. Long term, I'd like to get some more submerged plant growth and floating plants in the water feature. Otherwise, there's not much I would change about this setup. I just want to let it mature and age like fine wine. The last thing that I want to mention is that what you saw is a maintenance routine that works for me. When you watch videos like this online, understand that your setup is different. It might have minor or drastic differences, and either way it will likely require different care. My recommendation is to use videos like this as a foundation to help you get started. 
plan it out all you want and gain as much information as possible before starting, but trust me, you can only predict so much. What I'm getting at is that be patient, do your research, learn from your mistakes, utilize your experience, and I know you will have success. I know that was all a bit of a mouthful, but I really wanted to include it in this video. I've talked enough though, I hope this gives you insight on what goes into maintaining my setups and a better idea of what it takes to keep a baladarium looking its best. As always, I greatly appreciate that you take the time to watch my videos and I hope you enjoyed this one as well. If you did, be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you haven't already. If you want to see more content about making and maintaining naturalistic enclosures and you're not yet subscribed to the channel, take a moment and join the Serpa Squad today. Anyways, until next week, take care and peace.